students from Mayapur Institute Bhakti Vaibha sessions when you did. Oh, really? Oh. It's such a pleasure to have you here. From on behalf of School of uh, Bhakti, we would like to welcome you. There are so many devotees eager to hear from you, Maharaj Ji. Okay. How are you doing? Can, can we share the screen for me? Sure. Yes, Maharaj Ji. I will, I will also make the co-host Maharaj Ji, but yes, we will do. Snail Prabhuji, is, is that okay? Could you be able to do that, please? Um, just one second. So we have a Snail Prabhuji who is, uh, so I'm one of the coordinators. And uh, Snail Prabhuji is one of the student and participant here who has been helping us out. So he knows most of the students and will be... So Maharaj, before we begin, is that okay if I will... Uh, most of the devotees here would know you anyways, but is that okay if I give a brief intro about you from Mayapur Institute? <coughs> uh, uh, okay, probably two minutes maximum. <laughs> Recording in progress. Thank you so much, uh, Maharaj. Uh, as I said, it's such a ble pleasure to have you here. Maharaj was uh, initiated by uh, His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada in London in 1971. A year later, Maharaj received second initiation. Maharaj has been preaching for the last 20 years in Asian countries such as India, Philippines, China, Thailand. Through his years of preaching, he has given countless souls practical guidance and deep inspiration. Taking sannyasa in Mayapur in 1994 from Tamal Krishna Goswamiji Maharaj. Maharaj didn't have much change because his lifestyle has always been very strict in his sadhana. So wherever Maharaj goes, he admires and devotees respects his sincere and faithful practice of chanting the holy name of the Lord. Maharaj is a truly ex great example of walks is dogs and we are looking forward for Maharaj's association. Thank you so much Maharaj for your association. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, that was written 20 years ago. <laughs> so it, it was de described how I'd spent 20 years but now it's 40 years. <laughs> okay, so we're on <clears throat> We're on the uh, first section of the Bhagavad Gita, right? Actually, for you, it's not Unit 1, it's Unit 3. But uh, as far as Bhagavad Gita goes, we could call it Unit 1. We're looking at chapters 1 to 6. And today, we're just going to cover a, a section of the first chapter. All right? Uh, so, before we even go into the first chapter, Bef as a prelude to the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada has quoted the Gita Mahatmya. So we bring it to your attention. It's listed there at the end of the introduction. It's actually just merged into the introduction. It's not kept separate there. So some of you may know the Gita Mahatmya, the glorification of Bhagavad Gita is customary for people who are studying Bhagavad Gita, that before they begin the Bhagavad Gita, they first of all may read the Gita Mahatmya. So here you can see Gita Mahatmya. Would one of you like to read that verse for me? Oh, yeah, don't be shy. Who would like to read? Shall I Prabhupada? Yeah, please go ahead, Mataji. Yeah. Nirmochanam Pumsham Jalas Nanam Dine Dine Shakri Gitamrita Snanam Samsara Mala Nasanam. Yes, very nice. You can read the translation also. One may cleanse himself daily by taking a bath in water, but if one takes a bath even once in the sacred Ganges, water of Bhagavad Gita, for him the dirt of material life is altogether vanquished. Thank you. Yeah, so here, here in Mayapur we have the sacred Ganges, but even better than the sacred Ganges is the water of the Bhagavad Gita. 
because the water of the Bhagavad Gita describes here will cleanse the dirt of material life and vanish it altogether. So very powerful. Right? Someone else like to read this verse? I can read. Um, Gita Sugita Kartavya Kim Anye Shastra Vistare Yas Vayam Padma Nabasya Mukha Padma Vinish Vita. Yes, and translation. One needs only attentively and regularly hear and read Bhagavad Gita. One need not read any other Vedic literature. Because it is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic literatures. All right. So some people, they read many books, and some people, they just read the Bhagavad Gita. We know Mahatma Gandhi was very fond of reading Bhagavad Gita. He used to carry the Bhagavad Gita with him. So... <clears throat> Here, in the Gita Mahatmya anyway, they're emphasizing reading the Bhagavad Gita. You don't need to read any other Vedic literature. Indeed, Shankaracharya is often quoted that he said that a little knowledge from Bhagavad Gita and a few drops of Ganges water and you can liberate yourself from the material world. So even Shankaracharya emphasized the Bhagavad Gita over all other literature. Okay, and then this one is very famous, a quite well-known verse of Gita Mahatmya. Sarvopanishado galvo dokta gopala nandana parto vatsa sudhir bhokta dukdam gitam ritam mahat <clears throat> this Gita Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, the essence of all the Upanishads is just like a cow. And Lord Krishna, who is famous as a cowherd boy, is milking this cow. Arjuna is just like a calf. And learned scholars and pure devotees are to drink the nectarian milk of Bhagavad Gita. So, not the example, right? The Bhagavad Gita is compared to the cow. And Lord Krishna is the cowherd boy, he's milking the cow. And Arjuna is the calf. When the calf is present, then the cow will give the best milk, it will be happy to give its milk. So, Arjuna is just like the calf. And also, that learned scholars and pure devotees, they're to drink the milk. The milk of Bhagavad Gita. Okay? So you can see Srila Prabhupada presented this Bhagavad Gita for us and calls it Bhagavad Gita as it is. There were so many other editions of Bhagavad Gita, but Prabhupada understood that these other editions of Bhagavad Gita didn't actually present the real, the real spirit of the Bhagavad Gita. The real spirit of Bhagavad Gita actually being to present the Bhagavad Gita in the authorized manner, as it is. So Prabhupada calls his Bhagavad Gita like that. And sometimes we say other people, they present Bhagavad Gita as they think it is or as they want it to be. But Prabhupada is presenting it in the authorized manner as received through the disciplic succession, through the parampara. So we'll be hearing about that as we go on, and we'll discuss the Bhagavad Gita more and more. And just for a beginning, uh, we do want to ask you to spend a little time just to look at Prabhupada's preface, the preface of the book, the Bhagavad Gita and which particular aspects of Prabhupada's mood and mission are revealed there in the preface. So we, 
Do you all have a, a, a copy with you? Do you have a soft copy or a hard copy of Bhagavad Gita with you? I would imagine you do, don't you? Anyway, you're going to need it. I want you to look at the preface and just have a, a quick read through the preface and see if you can pick out, see if you can identify some of the particular aspects of Prabhupada's mood and mission as it's described there in the preface. All right? Can you, uh, we will just give you some few minutes to do this.
All right. Can we have some comments? Uh, did you pick up something? Prabhupada's mood and mission, which is mentioned there in the preface. Yes, two participants have raised their hands. Who is this now? Who has put their hand up? Let me see. Yes, can somebody help me there? I'm not able to see all the people, all the devotees. Sure, Guruji. I think one of us is uh, me, uh, Madan. Hare Krishna to you and everyone. So, um, a couple of things that stood out for me uh, as I was reading the preface is, um, you know, the aspect of humility. Um, because, you know, uh, Prabhupada says that, um, you know, he does not want to take any credit because this is really, um, you know, like um, knowledge that's coming from Krishna in disciplic uh, succession. So, I mean, that stood out very well. And, he's, uh, and he also makes a reference to saying that if he uh, if there is, a, if personally I have any credit in this matter, it's only because I've tried to present Bhagavad Gita as it is. So that's one thing that stuck out. And one more thing that, that did strike me is uh, uh, Prabhupada's, you know, like attempt in uh, wanting to uh, present the Bhagavad Gita in a very genuine, historically authorized natural and transcendental way. Uh, so, uh, because obviously, as you mentioned, Prabhuji, there, there are many uh, interpretations of Gita, and uh, what he wanted to do is to present it exactly as it is, so that there is no uh, mental speculation, there is no, uh, um, you know, like interpretation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think he wanted to do that in the most genuine manner, in the most sincere manner, um, through the disciplic succession, so that, uh, you know, we get the full essence of the uh, knowledge of God. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice contribution. Yes, I appreciate that. Certainly Prabhupada's humility comes out. That Prabhupada said, I, I, I don't have really any credit. He said, if there's any credit, it should go to... Who, should, who did Prabhupada want to give the credit to? Spiritual Master. Oh, to the spiritual master. Yes, right, to his spiritual master, right. That's the proper mood of a disciple, that if there's any credit, then he will give it, he will offer that to his spiritual master. The disciple never considers himself to be a, a very great devotee, but if there is any credit, then it should be given to the spiritual master, that he's the one who deserves the credit. Yes, very nice. And also, very good that you brought up the point about the authoritative version of the Bhagavad Gita, how the Bhagavad Gita is presented in a very authoritative manner with the Sanskrit verses and then the word-for-word -word translation. When I joined the movement, as you heard, I, I was initiated in 1971. I had come to Krishna consciousness in 1971 there in London. And at that time, the full edition of the Bhagavad Gita had not been published. There was an abridged version of the Bhagavad Gita, and it wasn't published by BBT, it was published by Macmillan, Macmillan Publishing Company in New York. Somehow, one, the, the, one of the devotees, specific, namely Brahmananda Prabhu, he'd gone there and he'd met the people, and they were interested to publish a Bhagavad Gita. And so he said, well, our guru has a Bhagavad Gita. And they looked it over and they agreed to publish it. But Prabhupada's, they considered Prabhupada's edition to be too voluminous. They thought there wouldn't be a market for such a voluminous book. So they had it cut down. They took out all the Sanskrit and they took out a lot of purports and they made it very brief. Anyway. That was the only book we had when I joined the movement. That was there. Oh, we had also volume one Krishna book. But of course, Bhagavad Gita is really the main book, and uh, we were using Bhagavad Gita, but it was abridged. And, and Prabhupada would come, and sometimes we'd go on morning walks with Prabhupada, and, and Prabhupada would be asking, what is this verse? Who knows this verse? <laughs> you, know, and, you know, we were new devotees, and we didn't even have the the Sanskrit edition of the book. <laughs> so we, we didn't know the verses. But there was one man, actually, he was from India. He'd been bought, brought up in India, and his father had taught him Bhagavad Gita. And on the morning walk, he would usually reply, and he knew all the verses. So Prabhupada appreciated very much 
when the devotees could quote the verses from the Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada would regularly quiz us on these things, you know. Who knows this verse? What does it mean? What? <laughs> so uh, Prabhupada expected us to read the books and to know what's in the books. So, yes, Prabhupada wrote this Bhagavad Gita in such a manner to educate people, to understand the Bhagavad Gita. That's what Prabhupada wants. He wants people to get an understanding of what is this Bhagavad Gita? Why is Krishna speaking this? Yes, somebody else like to offer a, another contribution about Prabhupada's mood and mission? Uh, Prabhupada, if I may, uh, I, a couple of things that really sticks out for me is the um, keeping it original. Prabhupada always says, don't, uh, don't alter it, don't give your own kind of opinions. And uh, the way he's written is, uh, and called it as it is, it kind of strikes a chord with a lot of people. Um, because you know that you're getting, so, you know, when we talk to anybody now, it's all about going back to what Prabhupada said in the, in the Gita or, or the Bhagavad or whatever. Uh, so that was one thing. But the other thing that I really um, endears him to everybody, I think, is that he he always mentions that let this be um, of use to the whole world. It's not for one person or another person or myself. Let the whole world benefit from this knowledge. And uh, that kind of strikes a chord with me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. Yes. Uh, on one occasion, Prabhupada was traveling in India and he'd come to Indore, a city of in Indore in India, and there was a Gita Bhavan there. So Prabhupada was giving lectures on Bhagavad Gita there. And he had met the Western, a group of Western devotees with him. It was like 1971 or some 72, and uh, Prabhupada was speaking strongly, and he would he would attack people who were Mayavadis and you know the bogus philosophies. Prabhupada would expose them and sometimes use words like rascals. And so one man, one gentleman who was attending the lectures, became a little disturbed. And he said, you know, your guru should see everyone equally. <laughs> so uh, when Prabhupada heard this, uh, this man was saying, you know, you should see everyone equally. You shouldn't just say if somebody's a, a rascal and so on. And, and then Prabhupada simply said, well, I am not on that platform. I don't see everyone equally. I have to make distinction. <laughs> Uh, Prabhupada said like that. But then later on, the devotees were talking to this gentleman and then they explained to him how Srila Prabhupada was traveling the world and he was preaching Bhagavad Gita all over the world. And then the man understood. He said, oh, I said, that is, that's wonderful. He said, that's perfect vision of equality to distribute the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita to the whole world without discrimination. So Prabhupada had that vision, he, that his, his mood and mission like that, he wasn't just thinking only to deliver the Indian people or the Hindu people, but he wanted to deliver the whole world because he understood this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita is meant for everyone. Yes, so the, the, this was Prabhupada's real vision of equality, that everyone can, be, can benefit by hearing the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita uh, without any kind of prejudice or discrimination against anyone. We want to give everyone the chance to become a devotee of Krishna. Yes, a little more about maybe Prabhupada's Humility or his mission? I think it's not was it? Um, I think his mission I, I understood in the last two sections. So he's basically establishing the the actual position of the soul and the Supreme Lord Krishna. 
So the way he's uh, tried to understand is, you want to read the Krishna words, or understand the Krishna words. Before that, you have to accept Krishna is the supreme that. Yeah? He's the supreme person of Godhead. Without you accepting that, reading Gita is no use. So because you have to accept him, he's, he's basically taught to Brahma, Sun God and everyone so many years back. So you have to believe in that. So he's trying to establish the actual truth before even we go into the Gita. All right. Yes. Prabhupada is presenting the actual truth of the Bhagavad Gita, the, this, this, the, how it's a, a history behind the Bhagavad Gita. It's not something new. It's not just some new presentation, but it's, 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 be, it's perennial knowledge. It means it, it's eternal knowledge. It's been around for so long. And as Prabhu just said, Krishna had spoken it before to the sun god, Bhivishvan. Yes. Thank you. And then also, if you notice at the end of the preface, Prabhupada makes a very humble point. He said, if, if even one person can become a devotee, I will consider my mission a success. If even one person can become a pure devotee of Krishna, then I will consider my mission a success. So that is, uh, again, gen genuine humility. Although in the, at the beginning of the preface, Prabhupada is talking about how this Krishna conscious movement is the most popular of all movements and people, young people are in America are all joining this Krishna consciousness movement and how their parents are appreciating how it's, it's done so much good for, the, for America. It's very fortunate that, the, that Swamiji Prabhupada had gone there to America. It's a blessing for America save the people from materialistic life and from a life of sense gratification. All right, would anyone like, want to add anything else before we go on? Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes. Uh, uh, just a small uh, reflection. Yeah, one has to accept uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is. Uh, and you know, I got Bhagavad Gita in 2015 from a devotee on, in Oxford Street. And I, it was lying and after like a couple of months, I picked it up and then when I read uh, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and I was like, no, I don't believe this and I kept it aside. And anyway, I was searching for the truth, truth and I think Bhagavad Gita came, <laughs> kept coming back to me and I, I kept rejecting it. <clears throat> and it was only in like 2019, <laughs> you know, when uh, you know, again, I started reading and slowly, slowly, I started getting the realization and then, yeah, next step was for me to join the Gita Life course and that's how, you know, I, I accepted the book. Oh, very good, yes. So, that's, m many of us came to Krishna consciousness in similar ways. We get a book, we, we receive the book and we read the book, you know, in the beginning, it's a little new for us and sometimes difficult for us to understand and to accept but somehow somehow something is there and somehow that seed which is planted just by our contact with the book somehow it's like a seed of bhakti is planted and that seed begins to sprout and it brings us into touch with the devotees and we go on we want to study more yeah i tried to study the Bhagavad Gita when I was a student. We had a, there, we were supposed to do a course on humanities and one of the subjects was on the Bhagavad Gita. But I couldn't understand anything what it was about. But later on when I went to the temple afterwards, I went to the Krishna Conscious Temple in London and I heard one of the young devotees speak and I, I was really interested, really attracted. It meant so much to me. All right, anything else? Ladies didn't offer any contribution here? Anything, ladies? Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I, I don't know what the ladies know, but I want to add one point of realization here. Yes. But like, I, 
So if somebody does some good work, like a, already set a platform, we just have to maintain that platform. So that's what Prabhupada mentioned here that Krishna comes every yuga and, and just to establish that relationship of him with the living living entities to, to make this Krishna consciousness active. So we just have to, like Krishna is coming every time and we just have to follow that same principle to establish that relationship with the Lord. And uh, here he says that we have to work according to Krishna's desires. So Krishna wants us to not to uh, rely on the mental, uh, sorry, senses of the material senses, but work for the spiritual consciousness. Um, and that is the highest perfection of life. That is what it's mentioned to Maharaj. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yes, we have to follow Krishna's plan, Krishna's process. It's not our own process. <laughs> we follow Krishna and know what Krishna's desire is. And that will give us the perfection in life. So the Bhagavad Gita is teaching us to surrender, right? Surrender means accepting Krishna's plan, Krishna's mission. And Prabhupada is revealing this to us through the purports of Bhagavad Gita. Okay, here's a few points just from the preface. Prabhupada writes, Our only purpose is to present the Bhagavad Gita as it is in order to guide the conditioned student to the same purpose for which Krishna descends to this planet once in a day of Brahma. So Lord Krishna comes once in a day of Brahma. There are many other incarnations, of course, in every age the Lord comes. But Lord Krishna personally, he comes once in a day of Brahma. And he's coming to guide us, to get us out of this material world. Instead of satisfying his own personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. The Lord wants this and he demands it. One has to understand the central point of Bhagavad Gita. Our Krishna Consciousness Movement is teaching the whole world this central point. All right, the central point. What is the central point? Yes, did you pick up? We need to satisfy, try to satisfy Krishna's senses, not our own senses. Right, and how can we satisfy Krishna? Spreading the Krishna Conscious Movement, spreading His teachings. Yeah, just simply by devotion. By devotion, Krishna is satisfied. If we have devotion, by devotion, then Krishna will be pleased. Krishna is conquered by devotion. So one of the points, one of the themes which we study in this Bhakti Shastri course is about the mood and mission. The mood and, you know, there's different items, uh, different categories in Prabhupada's writings, in Prabhupada's purports. And we try to uh, encourage the students to identify these different items which are brought up. And it's particularly important to appreciate the mood and mission. As we said here, to help students understand and appreciate the mood and mission of Srila Prabhupada and to perpetuate that understanding within the ISKCON society. Yeah, we want to continue this uh, mood which Prabhupada had. We want to continue it. Although Prabhupada has not physically with us anymore, but still we want to perpetuate and continue that same mood which Prabhupada had to distribute Krishna consciousness to everyone without any discrimination. And if even one person can become a pure devotee, then we will feel our mission has been successful. All right, so we've covered the preface. We're going to go on to the first chapter. So, 
you can see chapter one, uh, the title of the first chapter, as you see in Prabhupada's book here, in our English edition, right? What is the title of the first chapter? Yes, the title of the first chapter is? Observing the armies on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Right, yes, that's the title which Srila Prabhupada has given for the, for the English edition of the Bhagavad Gita. But the actual title in the Sanskrit language, this is called Vishada Yoga. The word Vishada means dejection or the yoga of dejection. And it's interesting to understand how dejection is actually a qualification for taking up this bhakti yoga process, for actually entering into understanding the Bhagavad Gita. This uh, Vishada yoga, was a, it was a beginning for Arjuna. His dejection brought him into, it made him a, a good candidate for hearing the message of Lord Krishna. All right? So, this Vishuddha Yoga is not mentioned in Prabhupada's purport, but I'm bringing, bringing it up to you just for your reference, to bring it to your attention, because that is actually the, the title of the first chapter in the original edition. So the name is Vishada Yoga. Right? Knowledge that is manifested by considering one's body as the self or soul is called Vishada Yoga. When a conditioned soul considers his body as the self, then he thinks Deha Dharma, Jati Dharma, Kula Dharma, Arya Dharma, etc. As Sanatan, religious principles, and he becomes puzzled by lamentation, illusion, fearfulness. All right, so th this way we're, we're presenting to you something of the reasoning behind this title, Vishada Yoga. We'll present more uh, as we go on with this first chapter. But generally, this Vishada Yoga, it's considering we're the body, we think of ourselves as the body. And of course, because we identify with the body, then many problems come. So we think in terms of these di different names are mentioned, like Deha Dharma, means the religion of the, the body, the, the Deha, the one who is embodied in the body. Jati, the birth, birth is important. Kula, Kula Dharma, Kula meaning our like caste or community. Arya Dharma, Sanatan, religious. The religious principles are sanatan, sanatan meaning eternal. We want to understand this sanatan dharma. This is actually Bhagavad Gita. But when we forget it, we become puzzled. And we think in terms of the body, lamentation, illusion, fear, all of these things come because we are identifying with the body instead of with our eternal spiritual nature. All right, so coming to the first verse of the Bhagavad Gita. It's a famous, of course, very famous. It's the first verse of the Bhagavad Gita. Who's speaking? Who's speaking the first verse? Uh, and who is he speaking to? Sanjaya. Right, he's speaking to Sanjay. Right, so Dhritaras. And where are they? Are they at Kurukshetra? They're in uh, 
Palace of uh, Dr. Rashna? Yes, they're in Kishapur. Yes, they're in the palace. They're not at Kurukshetra. Why not? Why is Tritarashtra not at Kurukshetra? Uh, because he was blind. Yes, he was blind. So, why is he concerned about Kurukshetra? What's his interest? His hundred sons were fighting in the Kurukshetra. Right. His one hundred sons were fighting there. So, the Bhagavad Gita begins by describing Kurukshetra as Dharma Kshetri. Dharma Kshetri, Kurukshetri. That Kurukshetra is a place, a place of Dharma. It's a, an important holy place. Today also you can go to Kurukshetra. It's a place on the map. <laughs> There's even a railway station there. You can go there. And uh, it's smaller today than it was in those days. It was a much bigger place in those days, 5,000 years ago. But still it's there and it's still an important place and it's a place of pilgrimage and it's respected as a place where Lord Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita and where the Kurukshetra war took place. Kurukshetra was also famous, uh, there, it, it's mentioned in 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam how at one point there was a, a solar eclipse and Lord Krishna came from Dwarka with all of his family members and all of his wives and they came to Kurukshetra. And Lord Krishna also arranged that all the gopis would come from Vrindavan. So Lord Krishna was anxious to meet all the gopis and they all came from Vrindavan to be with Krishna. So Kurukshetra is interesting that it's the only place outside of Vrindavan where Krishna could meet with Radharani, the only place outside of Vrindavan, Kurukshetra, because all the gopis came there and they met Krishna at Kurukshetra. So that's a very wonderful pastime which took place at Kurukshetra. They come there to Kurukshetra because Kurukshetra was a place of Dharma. And at the time of solar eclipse, when there's an eclipse, it's customary for people to do some sacrifice, to perform some yagya, and to give charity to the sages and the brahmanas. So with this intention, Lord Krishna had come there. But here you have another reason taking place. Dharma Kshetri Kuru Kshetri Samaveda Yayutsava that they've come for battle, they've assembled to do battle. Mamaka Pandavas Chaiva Kim Akurvata Sanjaya. So Dhritarashtra is asking, what did my sons, Mamaka and Pandavas, what did my sons and the son of Pandu do, being desirous to fight? So, we note in the very first verse of the Bhagavad Gita, what is the mood of Dhritarashtra, right? Who would like to tell me, what is the particular mood of Dhritarashtra here? Uh, Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Um, as, I, as I understand it, he's, he's a little bit apprehensive um, because he knows of of the Pandavas being pious um, uh, and so he's kind of trying to get as much information as he can to understand where his uh, where his sons are and where the Pandavas are and also um, the other thing oh, I have one other thing look, it's completely slipped my mind there um, oh yes yeah, he in in this verse, he in the uh, third line, he kind of um, shows that he doesn't see the Pandavas as his own sons. He's kind of separating his 
uh, sons with the bundles. So yeah. uh, he's still got this material attachment to his his um, sons. Yes, right. That's the the major point here in this opening verse. The Dhritarashtra is revealing his vision. You know, vision. How you know what we the vision we should have is that we should see everyone equally. You know, I was speaking how you know, that man in Indoor was complaining that your Swamiji does not, he does not have equal vision. He doesn't see everyone equally. And generally that's what we, we would expect. Of course, Prabhupada did see people equally because Prabhupada was giving the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita to everyone without discrimination. But here you can see Dhritarashtra, how he's discriminating. He's discriminating between his sons and the sons of Pandu. Right? Just now, was that proper? What, what, what was wrong with that? What, what actually, Dhritarashtra, what is his relationship with the Pandavas? Uh, Dhritarashtra was the uncle of Pandavas and the thing, uh, I think he should have treated the nephews also as like his own sons without differentiating. Yes, why? Why particularly he should see his Pandavas like his own sons? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Is it because uh, Pandavas were take, uh, took shelter by Dhritarashtra when they were young because they lost his father? Yes, right. They, they, sorry. Yeah. Yes, right. Maharaj Pandu, he died while the, the, boy, the Pandavas were young children. And they were very young children when their father left the body. So the Pandavas were brought up by Kunti without their father. Remember, uh, Pandu actually had two wives, Madri and Kunti, and Madri performed sati with her husband, and she left the body along with Maharaj. When they burned Maharaj Pandu's body, that time Madri also entered into the fire, and Kunti was to stay back to take care of the sons, because there were five sons and they needed someone to look after them. So Dhritarashtra was their uncle, and although he was blind, it, he was really like their guardian. He was expected to be their guardian and to look after them and care for them. There certainly, we, we would say that the Kurus, but the Pandavas are also Kurus, right? It's not just only Dhritarashtra's sons are Kurus. The Pandavas are also Kurus, but he discriminates against them. Yeah, Mamaka, Pandavas, my sons and the sons of Pandu, that making distinction. Hmm. So this is Dhritarashtra's vision. And this, this is of course the cause of this whole battle of Kurukshetra, because he does, because he has that kind of vision. He has that, that selfish vision. Okay. So Dhritarashtra is inquiring from Sanjay, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do, assembled at the place of pilgrimage, desiring to fight? Dhritarashtra is concerned, he's a little concerned, that maybe his sons will just make a make an agreement not to fight. Maybe they'll just, you know, come to terms and settle their differences. Dhritarashtra was actually eager that they should fight because Dhritarashtra is pretty confident that his sons are going to have the advantage. They have a much bigger army and they have some very great generals. And so Dhritarashtra is very confident in his own sons that they're going to win the battle. 
And he doesn't want them to make any peace agreements. He wants that the, fa the battle should go on and of, he's hoping that that will be the end of it, you know, the Pandus will be either killed or completely defeated and they'll have to just disappear from the world. So that was Dhritarashtra's concern. He wanted that there should be a battle and he's asking Sanjay, what did they do? Are they ready? Are they going to fight? So Kurukshetra, a religious field, dharma meaning religious and Kshetra, a field, a field of religion, and they've come here to settle their dispute. So this uh, Kurukshetra had been a holy place, a place of dharma for many hundreds and, hundreds and thousands of years. It's a, a, whole, a very holy place. Even, as we said, 5,000 years ago, Lord Krishna had come there to perform sacrifice. So it's a very important holy place. And somehow it was arranged that this battle would take place there at Kurukshetra. And of course, that's, that's an advantage for the Pandavas. Because it's a holy place, and because the Pandavas are religious people, they're, they're accustomed to follow Dharma. And so to have the battle in the place of Kurukshetra will certainly be in their favour. So in the purport of the first text, Srila Prabhupada gives an analogy. We want to bring to your attention this analogy. He says, as in the paddy field, the unnecessary plants are taken out. In the religious field of Kurukshetra, unwanted plants like Dhritarashtra's son, Duryodhan, and others would be wiped out. <laughs> okay, an interesting example. You know, you grow some rice, some, you have, if you have a field and you're growing some rice, it's important to pull out the the weeds, the unnecessary plants, they should be taken out. You often see the farmers in the field and they're just going around pulling out the weeds and pulling out the unnecessary plants before they choke the rice. So in the same way, in the religious field of Kurukshetra, the unwanted plants like Duryodhan and others, they'll be wiped out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mamaka, my sons, this making distinction, friend and enemy, my sons, they're mine, the sons of Pandu, they're my enemies. You know, this, this, this mood of, this vision, this is the vision of Dhritarashtra. And this is not the vision which we want to encourage, this is a very materialistic vision. And you have that kind of materialistic vision, you won't be happy. You won't, you'll never get peace of mind with that kind of vision. You'll never be satisfied. Okay, going ahead. So we come to text number three up to t text number 11, describing to us about Duryodhana's diplomacy. Would someone like to read the verse for me? Yes, please, don't be shy. Prabhuja, I'll read. Um, so, yeah, Duryodhana's diplomacy, Pashyaitan Andu Putrana, Acharya Mahatim Chamum, Vyodham Dropada Putrena, Tva Sisyena Dhimata. Oh, my teacher, behold the great army of the sons of Pandu, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. Mm, yes, the son of Drupada. Who is that son of Drupada? What's his name? Drishtadyum Maharaj. Yes, and what's the name of his sister? Draupadi. Draupadi. Yes, right. And where did, where were they born from? 
How were they born? Fire ceremony. Yeah? Fire ceremony. Yes, right. They fire. Born from the fire, right. Drupada did a, a sacrifice. What did he want? What was his purpose in doing the yagya? To get a son who can kill... Um, <laughs> who can kill the... Yeah. Dronacharya. Right, yes. He wants a son who can kill Dronacharya. So, you can understand that Dropada was not friends with Drona. <laughs> uh, initially, Dropada and Drona had been friends and they were together in, in the Gurukula. Although Drupada, he's a Kshatri from the royal family, from the family of kings, and Drona is from the family of Brahmanas. But they were friends, they made friendship together. And in their friendship, Drupada had actually told Drona that, you know, I will always be your friend, you know, if ever you ever need my help, come to me, I will be happy to help you. But after they had finished their studies, They'd gone off and they both got married and entered into family life and so on. And so Drona also had a son. What was the name of the son of Dronacharya? Ashwatthama. Ashwatthama, right. And so Drona was, he was a Brahmana, he was very poor. And it said his son did not even know what was milk. He'd never tasted even what was cow's milk. So Drona felt very sorry that his son was experiencing so much poverty in his childhood. So Drona came to Drupada and requested Drupada that, you know, we are friends, Can, you should help me. But Drupada had changed. And he said to Drona, he said, how can I be your friend? Friendship is possible only between equals. And you're a poor man and I'm a king. How can I be your friend? So this was an insult to Drona. So Drona had to leave there in an angry mood. And he went away and he went to the Hastinapur and he became the military guru of the Kurus and the Pandavas. And he taught, because they had many children there, you know, Gandhari has a hundred sons and Kunti has her Pandav five sons. And so there's many young men there, they all need to be taught how to fight and how to use weapons and the military arts. And Drona was expert, he knew everything. So Drona was there and he trained them, he was their military guru. So after he trained them all, then he asked them for Guru Dakshin. And first of all, the Kurus went. The Kurus went to fight Maharaj Drupada. But somehow Maharaj Drupada defeated them. And the Kurus came back, embarrassed, defeated. So then the Pandavas went. And they had a fierce battle with Maharaj Drupada. And they defeated him. And they tied him up and brought him back as a prisoner. And they brought him back and put him at the feet of Drona. So Drona then said, okay, I'm going to take away half your empire, half your kingdom. So he took away half the kingdom of Maharaj Drupada and then sent him away. So Maharaj Drupada was very bitter that that Drona took away half of my kingdom. So that was why Drupada did a sacrifice to get a son who could kill Drona. And at that time also Drupadi was born. So Maharaj Drupada is mentioned here, it's mentioned Drupada Putrina. He didn't say Drishta Jumna, he just said Drupada Putrina, the son of Drupada. Why does he say that? Because Duryodhana is speaking to, who is he speaking to? Dronacharya. Dronacharya, yes, he's saying, oh my teacher, 
The, who is the teacher of Duryodhana? Dronacharya. So he's speaking to Dronacharya. He said, just you, you see this? Drupada Putrena. He's telling, you know, Drupada is the enemy of Drona. And he, Drona, Drona also knows that this, that this uh, Abhimanu, not Drista Jumna, this Drista Jumna is born just to kill Drona. But Drona is so magnanimous as a Brahmana that he accepted Drishya Jumna as his student. Mention Tava Sishyena Dimata. Right? That your intelligent disciple has expertly arranged the soldiers. <laughs> yeah. So this shows the, the liberal nature of Dronacharya as a Brahmana, that even though he knew that Drishta Jumna was born to kill him, but he accepted Drishta Jumna as a student. Even though he was Drupada Putrena, he was the son of his enemy, but still Drona accepted him as a student. And he gave him knowledge and he trained him in the military arts. But he knew that later this, this man is going to kill me later on. And so this is a wonderful example of the liberal nature of a Brahmana. That even though you know this person is going to kill you later on, he does not mind. He says, All right, he wants to be my student, let me teach him. And he taught him. It's mentioned, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple. So Duryodhana, Duryodhana's pointing out, you know, what to watch out for. He knows that Dronacharya has to fight against this, this uh, in this situation. The Drishta Jumna's there, and Drishta Jumna's born to kill him, and he's, he's organizing the army also. So he's warning Drona, he wants Drona to be aware of what's going on on the other side. Is it clear? Any questions on this so far? Okay. Right. Yes? Right, I have one quick question, if that's possible. Um, so Dron Dronachari was uh, a Brahmin, Brahmana. Um, should he be then, um, is he not acting like a Kshatriya in, in training the Kauras? Yeah, he's a Brahmana, but he took up the teaching of military arts. But Prabhupada explains that whatever you know, you should teach. That's a Brahmana. So D Drona knew how to fight with weapons. He knew the military arts. Although he was a Brahmana, he knew this military art, so in order to support his son, to maintain his son, and so as to take proper care of his son, he taught these military arts to the Kurus and to the Pandavas. One, one of the devotees, uh, His Grace Burijan Prabhu, a senior Prabhupada disciple, he told us, he said, when he was a young devotee, he said he got a job in a brick factory and he came back and he told Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, he said, I've got a job in the brick factory, I've learned how to make bricks. And Prabhupada said, oh, very good. He said, now you must teach it to others. <laughs> and Prabhupada told, you know, he was encouraging Bharijan, said, you've learned something, you must teach it to others. So this is a Brahman, this is the mood of the Brahman. What you know, you will share, you'll teach it to others. So this was Duryodhana. But you see also Drona, that although he's a Brahman, still he's fighting, he's in the battlefield. He has to fight also. <laughs> yeah, you know, the Brahmanas are also fighting. You've got the Acharyas, you know, the Acharya, Dronacharya, Kripacharya. They're both there in the battle. They're both fighting. Do, do we know how he got that knowledge? 
No, I, I don't personally know the history about Drupada, how he got all that knowledge about how to use all the weapons and so on. That's an interesting... Uh, we could look into that. Maybe I have to read the Mahabharat more. <laughs> it's Parshurama. He learned it from Parshurama. He learned, uh, did he? He learned from Parshurama? Yeah, Dronacharya learned it from Parshurama when he was giving up all his weapons and other things uh, and his art. So, Dronacharya learned it from Parshurama. Uh, okay, thank you, Prabhu. Okay. Okay. So, Drupada Putrena Tavashishyena Dimahta. Right? The son of Drupadi. And that he's expertly arranged the army. <laughs> so, Duryodhana wants uh, Drona to be aware. Prabhupada speaks here. This is from a lecture given in London, 1973. Yeah, Prabhupada, when we, we just got Bhaktivedanta Manor at that time, and Prabhupada came there to England and he began lecturing. He was giving Bhagavatam class in the morning and he lectured Bhagavad Gita every evening. And he began lecturing from the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. And there were many lectures. Okay, so Prabhupada said, Dronacharya knew that Dropad Maharaj has got his son. In future, he would kill me. Still, when he was offered to become his disciple, to learn military art, he accepted. Yes. That means the brahmanas were so liberal. When he is coming as my disciple, never mind, he would kill me in future. Doesn't matter, but I must give him teaching. Hmm. So Drupad, Drona knew Drupada Maharaj is his enemy and Drupada has a son and that son was born to kill Drona. But still Drona said, yeah, all right, yeah, you can be my student, yes. <laughs> so the brahmanas were so liberal. All right, so Drupada Putrena Tavashishina Dimata and then Going on text number four, we read about Arjuna and how Arjuna has celestial weapons, weapons which were given to him by Lord Shiva, different devas, they made presentations to Arjuna. And then Bhima had made some terrible vows. Who knows anything about the vows which Bhima had made? Yes, there were three vows actually. Do you remember one of them? To be an eternal brahmachari and not to marry? No, no, that's Bhishma. This is Bhima. Ah, Bhima. Okay, Bhima is to, sorry. Bhima to kill uh, Duryodhana. Uh, yeah, Bhima vows, vows to what? Kill who? Uh, to to kill Duryodhana and Shishupal. Uh, no, uh, Duryodhana and... Uh, uh, um, and his younger brother, sorry. How many younger brothers has he got? Maharaj, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a Dushasana because I think he was the person who was uh, disturbing uh, Draupadi. So uh, Bhima was so incensed that he said that I'm going to like tear him apart or something like that. Yes, there were three vows. First vow was that he would kill all the sons of Dhritarashtra. All the 100 sons of Dhritarashtra, he would be killed. Sometimes Arjuna and others had the opportunity to kill sons of Dhritarashtra. They wouldn't kill them. They'd leave it for Bhim, because they knew Bhim had made the vow that he would kill them all. And he did. And they arranged like that. They wouldn't, Arjuna and Yudhisthira, they, they wouldn't kill the sons of Dhritarashtra. They left them for Bhim. That was the first vow. The second vow was, that he would break the thigh of Duryodhana because Duryodhana had mockingly slapped his thigh and said to Draupadi, you can sit here on my thigh, come and sit here on my lap here like this. So when, she, when he said like that to, Bhima, to Draupadi, that Bhima was so angry, he vowed, he said, in the future I will break that thigh. And he did. 
And then the third vow was, as you mentioned, Dushasan. That Dushasan had vowed, Dushasan had touched Drupadi's hair and he had untied her hair. So Bhima vowed that he would rip open his heart and drink the blood. And he even brought the blood from Dushasan to wash the hair of Draupadi. And Draupadi kept her hair untied until she got the blood from Dushasan. And it was only then that she washed her hair and then she tied her hair and covered her hair. So those were the terrible vows of Bhima. He also ripped off the arm of Dushasan because Dushasan's arm had molested Draupadi, untying her hair, touching her. So Bhima was so angry, he made these terrible vows and he kept them. He made all those vows. So then we hear about Maharatas. A Maharata, one who can fight with 10,000 archers, skillful in the knowledge of scripture and weapons. So Maharati is not just only skillful in fighting, but he's also knowledgeable. He knows the scriptures. And you see great uh, Kshatriya kings, even in the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Maharaj Prataparudra, that he was in very good knowledge of the scripture. Maharaj Prataparudra, when he came, you know, he had to disguise himself to meet Lord Chaitanya. So at that time he came and he was reciting Gopi Geet. So he knew scriptures very well. So the kings were not, they were not illiterate, but they were well educated, very learned in both fighting and in scriptural knowledge. And they were such powerful fighters, they could fight with 10,000 people. All right, so uh, some other text. Let's see, text number seven. Let me see what text number seven. All right. There are personalities like you, Bhishma, Karna, Kripa, Ashwatthama. Oh, that's eight, sorry. But, if, but for your information, O oh best of the Brahmanas, let me tell you about the captains who are especially qualified to lead my military force. Okay, so captains, <laughs> best of the Brahmanas. For your information, O oh best of the Brahmanas, let me tell, best of the Brahmanas, this is Duryodhana speaking and he's talking to Drona and he's talking to Kripa like that, he's addressing them. He wants to tell them about the people. For your information, samgyata artam, for the benefit of the army. So Duryodhana wants to speak to encourage his army. He's trying to inspire them and to encourage them that when they go out on the battlefield, they will feel confident, they will feel enlivened, and they will be able to fight to the best of their ability. So this is how Duryodhana is using his diplomacy. He wants to encourage them before the battle, to give, put them in the right mood. You know, like if you ever play sports, maybe you're in a cricket team or a football team or something, or a volleyball team or something, you know, the coach will come and talk to you and you often see the coach and he's there, he's talking to the team and he's telling them, you know, what to watch out for and what are the, the, the strong points of the enemy and what points do we, that we, have, we have to worry about on our side. So he wants, they want to make you clear about everything so that you can take, make proper arrangements so that you can perform properly and win the match. 
All right. So then text number eight describes some of these great captains who are there on the other side. So Drop Duryodhana has another problem. He's faced with who to mention first because you have Bhishma and you have Drona and they're both great warriors, they're both great fighters with great personalities. So who to mention first? You have Bhishma and Drona and Karna and Kripa. So who to mention first? So Duryodhana shows his diplomacy. He mentions first of all he mentions first of all Drona because Drona's a Brahmana. So the Brahmanas are superior to the Kshatriyas. Bhishma is Kshatriya. So the Brahmanas are the head. Therefore he says, Bhavan Bhishmas Chakarnas Cha. Right? First he mentions you and then Bhishma and Karna. Karna actually was an enemy of Bhishma. <laughs> and Karna vowed he would not fight until Bhishma falls. He said, if I fight, I'll do all the work and Bhishma will get all the credit. So he said, I'm not going to fight until Bhishma falls on the battlefield. After Bhishma falls on the battlefield, then I will come out and fight. And that's what happened. Mm. So Karna came later. And then it also mentions about Vikarna, Ashwatthama Vikarnascha. So Vikarna. He's not really, he's not really on the level of the other great soldiers, but Duryodhana wants to encourage him because Vikarn was disturbed when they tried to disrobe Draupadi. And at that time, Vikarn was the only one to raise objection. So Duryodhana was worried that Vikarn may he may defect, he may go and join the side of the Pandavas. So he, Duryodhana is using his diplomacy by praising him, by including him in, this, in the list of great soldiers like Drona and Bhishma and Karna, and he adds on Vikarna. Actually, Vikarna is not really on their level, but he wants to encourage him to stay on their side. He doesn't want to lose them. And text number nine, Madarte Chatva Jivita, who are prepared to lay down their lives for my sake. So this is the mood of the Kshatriya. They go out to fight. They have that mood that they will give up their life. Either they will win or they will die on the battlefield. They're prepared. And they're they're, they're not feeling really any anxiety about it. Rather, they're happy that they can give up their lives on the battlefield. All right, then text number 10, we have these uh, two words, aparyaptam and paryaptam. Aparyaptam tad asmakam, paryaptam twaitam etesam. So, Aparyaptam meaning un unlimited, great power. If you look at the text number 10, uh, Prabhupada explains here, Aparyaptam, he describes it as meaning immeasurable. But that word can also mean limited. It has two meanings actually. Prabhupada here took the meaning as immeasurable. And according to how you take it, when it mentions here, just like it says here, immeasurable, then it means that it's very pleasing to Bhisma. Because Duryodhana is saying, our strength is immeasurable and we are perfectly protected by Grandfather Bhishma. Whereas the strength of the Pandavas, carefully protected by Bhim, is limited. Paryaptam, limited. So, be hearing like this, that, that our strength is unlimited, headed by Grandfather Bhishma, if we take the meaning to mean unlimited, then Bhishma is feeling very pleased. Yes, I'm, you know, it's very great, you know, it's pleasing to Bhishma. 
But if you take the other meaning, if you take meaning limited, then it's pleasing to Drona. Because what's happening then? Duryodhana is saying that our strength is limited because Bhishma, because of Grandfather Bhishma. Grandfather Bhishma has some affection for the Pandavas. And so he may not fight to his full ability because he has some partialities, feeling affection for the Pandavas. So, in this way, Duryodhana is encouraging Drona that you'll have to fight better to make up for Bhishma because Bhishma's got some affection. He won't fight to his full ability because he's partial to the Pandavas. So in this way, <laughs> Duryodhana very cleverly encouraged both Drona and Bhishma. According to the meaning, they would read their own meanings to the words of Duryodhana, and one way would be pleasing to Bhishma, and the other way would be pleasing to Drona. So you see Duryodhana is a very expert dip diplomat, and he could speak very cleverly to encourage the soldiers on his side. Also, Prabhupada talks about these different names, right? Prabhupada said, so people may ask that by mentioning these great fighters, what spiritual progress we make? You know, sometimes we read the Bhagavad Gita and these different names are there. It, it can be bewildering for people. These names are not names which we're always familiar with. Oh, Prabhupada says, because we are meant for chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, so by chanting the names of these great fighters, what do we gain? The question may be raised there. And Prabhupada continues, but the thing is, Nirbanda Krishna Sambande, whenever there is connection with Krishna, that also becomes Krishna. So these warriors' name, these warriors' name mentioning, we should not neglect. Krishna wanted to gather all the demonic power in that battlefield of Kurukshetra and kill them. That was his plan. From Prabhupada's lecture on Bhagavad Gita 1-4 in London, 1973. All right, so. Prabhupada is explaining these, all these names, that they're in relation to Krishna. So Krishna had gathered all these different kings from different parts of the world because the world was overburdened with all the demonic power. So Krishna wants to relieve the earth of the burden. And so he arranged, he brought everyone to Kurukshetra and let everyone be killed. And sometimes it happens like that. Sometimes, uh, you know, you get, sometimes it's a, an airplane with many, many important people on the airplane. And sometimes the airplane will just, you know, just vanish or just go into the sea somewhere, never found again. So Krishna arranges, he just brings everyone together and they just leave the world like that. So. Krishna makes these arrangements to relieve the earth of the burden. Those of you who are familiar with the Srimad Bhagavatam or the Krishna book, you will know how Mother Earth had prayed to Lord Brahma that she was overburdened by so many demoniac kings. And then Lord Brahma prayed to Lord Vishnu in Svetadweep, and Lord Vishnu told Lord Brahma that he would take birth in the Yadu dynasty and all the demigods should also come there and take birth there in the Yadu dynasty. So in this way, Lord Krishna appeared. And that led, later on, you have the, bat the battle of Kurukshetra. And all the kings come and they all take part in the battle and they're all killed. So the earth is relieved of the burden. Okay. Going ahead. 
text number 11. Someone like to read? I'll repeat Prabhuji. So, Ayaneshu cha sarveshu yata bhagam avasthita bhishman eva virakshantu bhavantu sarva eva hi. All of you must now give full support to Grandfather Bhishma as you stand at your respective strategic points of entrance into the phalanx of the army. Yes, Grandfather Bhishma is leading the army and Duryodhana is appealing to everyone. Give your support to Grandfather Bhishma and enter into the army. We ask a question, why was Duryodhana confident of the full support of Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya? Now certainly it's surprising, you know, Bhishma Dev, as we heard, I was just saying, you know, he has some partiality to the Pandavas. And Dronacharya, he is also connected to the Pandavas. Right? What was Dronacharya's connection with the Pandavas? Arjuna was his favorite student. Yes, Arjuna was his favorite student. Was he the only student? I mean, all the Pandavas. Yes, the teacher of all Pandavas. Yeah, they were all students of Dronacharya, right? And what about Bhishma Dev? What's Bhishma Dev's relationship with the Pandavas? Grandfather. Yes, the grandfather. So, certainly grandfathers, usually grandfathers are very affectionate to the grandchildren. And we see sometimes in the material world here, we see people with their grandchildren. The grandfather feels so much love and affection for the grandchildren. They become overwhelmed. So, why was Duryodhana confident of support of Bhishma and Dronacharya? Any suggestions on this? Maharaj, because uh, Bhishma Dev had taken a vow uh, that uh, he will uh, uh, support uh, the king of uh, Hastinapur long back and whoever is, is in the throne, he will support uh, that king. So mm -hmm. that is why Duryodhana was confident that Bhishma Dev, even though he has liking for Pandavas, but he will still fight for the kingdom. Mm. Okay. Bhishma Devan made a vow like that. And Maharaj, I think Duryodhan, somewhere he knew that Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya are uh, like they follow dharma. And they, if they will be, they will support. So, I mean, they will not do anything wrong when it comes to dharma. Yes, but when it comes to dharma, who was actually supposed to be the king? Who was meant to be the king? Originally, there was, there was Pandu and there was Dhritarashtra and there was Vidura. Now, of course, Vidura cannot be the king because he's born from the womb of a Sudra lady. But what about Pandu and Dhritarashtra? Who was the oldest? Dhritarashtra was oldest, but because he was weak and blind, so he was not chosen for the throne. Right, because Dhritara, although Dhritarashtra was eldest, he was born blind. So they thought to have a blind king would be useless. So the throne came to Pandu. But then Pandu got a problem. Pandu had a problem. He, he had a curse on him. Pandu, yes. Pandu, of course, has two wives, Kunti and Madri. And, but he's not able to conceive any children by them because he has a curse against him. 
that if he ever tries to have union with any of his wives, he will die. So it happened. He went off to the, you know, very, he went to the to countryside, quiet place. He want, they wanted to, they thought, be in a place of the mode of goodness. Pandu thought, if I stay in the palace, in the palace there's so much sense enjoyment there. The business of kings, you know, drinking and gambling and so many ladies and so on. It would be difficult for him to control his passions. And so they'd gone off to a quiet place, but still somehow Pandu had become disturbed. And somehow he had an, uh, tried to have an, uh, some union with Madri and it resulted in his death. So, with the death of Pandu, the sons of Pandu should have become the king. Why didn't they become the king? When Pandu died, why didn't the sons of Pandu become the king? Maharaj, they were very young. Yes. They were too young to they take were, up. They were too young, right. They were just children. They couldn't become the kings because they were just children. They were considered too young. So, who got the throne? Who became the king? Dhritarashtra. Yes, Dhritarashtra. He comes back to Dhritarashtra. Although he's blind, he becomes a king. So then the problem comes. Dhritarashtra is a king, and the sons of Pandu, they're growing up, they're getting older, and they want a kingdom. They want some land to rule. But they, they don't want to give them any land. There's a dispute. They don't want to give even enough land to go through the eye of an e a needle. So the, the Pandavas are in a very difficult... <coughs> they're in a very difficult situation. What to do? So the, they had no alternative but to go to war. And that's what the sons of Dhritarashtra want. Duryodhana wants war. They want the death of the Pandavas. They don't want to give any land to the Pandavas. But still, you have the issue when the war comes about, who's going to fight, on which side? Now you say, follow dharma but who are supposed to be the kings actually the sons of pandu were meant to be the kings so who was following dharma you cannot say that just just because uh duryodhana dhritarashtra is the king so bhishma and drona fight for dhritarashtra because that's dharma because he was the king we could argue that the dharma was actually that those Pandavas should have been given the kingdom. They were not given proper dharma. So what was the reason why Duryodhana was confident of Bhishma and Drona supporting him? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I think I, I remember reading in the Parkwood Prabhupada says that because the uh, Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya didn't disturb much when they were disrobing the uh, Draupadi. So, because he, they didn't stop it, so they, uh, Duryodhana has like a little bit confident that this time also they may support Duryodhana. I mean, yeah. Yes, right. That's right, Prabhu. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Bhishma and Drona had stood by and watched when they tried to disrobe Draupadi. And they didn't say anything. They didn't protest. Although it was against all dharma, they did not voice any protests. So Duryodhana was confident. This way Bhishma and Drona, they're, going, they're, going, they're on his side. Prabhupada explains from text 11 purport, He was confident of the full support of Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya in the battle because he well knew 
that they did not even speak a word when Arjuna's wife Draupadi, in her helpless condition, had appealed to them for justice while she was being forced to appear naked in the presence of all the great generals in the assembly. Alright, and then going ahead, we have signs of victory for the Pandavas. So we heard about Duryodhana's diplomacy, now we're hearing about signs of victory for the Pandavas. And it's there in these five verses. Uh, festival of fighting by Pandavas. <laughs> for, the, for the Kshatriyas, fighting is a festival. Just like devotees, we like kirtan, we like festivals. And so for Kshatriyas like the Pandavas, their festival is when they get a good fight. So, first point, sign of victory, Madhava. Right? What do, what's the meaning of Madhava? Madhava means? Krishna. Yes, of course, it means Krishna, name of Krishna. But specifically, it's his relationship with who? Lakshmi. Uh, uh, demon Madhu? No, no, the demon Madhu is Madhusudan. That Madhu is Sudan. Madhu yes. Sudan, right. This is Madhava. Madhava means one who is the husband of the goddess of fortune. As Prabhu said, Lakshmi, one devotee said there, Lakshmi. So Madhava means one who is the husband of the goddess of fortune. Lord Krishna, of course, is the husband of the goddess of fortune. And because Lord Krishna is on the side of the Pandavas, it means the goddess of fortune is also bestowing her blessings on the side of the Pandavas. So that is a very auspicious thing for the Pandavas, to have the blessings of the goddess of fortune. That's one point. And then there's another point, divyo shankam, meaning the transcendental conch shell, the conch shells which are blown uh, on the battlefield. The different Kshatriyas had their different conch shells. Do you know the name, Lord Krishna's conch shell? Panchajanya. Yes, right, Panchajanya, described in how he got that conch shell in 10th Canto Bhagavatam. And what's the name of Arjuna's conch shell? Pradatta. Devadatta, yes, right. So they each have their transcendental conch shells. And the conch shell is one of the four symbols in the arms of Lord Vishnu, right? Lord Vishnu has four arms. He has the conch shell and he has the club and he has the lotus flower and he has the Sudarshan chakra. And so there's the conch shell and the lotus flower for the devotee and there's the club and the Sudarsan chakra for the demon. And so four arms, two for the demons and two for the devotees. And so in the beginning of the battle, they blow their transcendental conch shells. And it's described how when they blew the conch shell, how it pierced the hearts, it shattered the hearts of the sons of Dhritarashtra. So the transcendental conch shell is another sign of auspiciousness for the Pandavas. And then also, Arjuna has won indestructible chariot, which had been given to him by the fire god Agni. We said different, different weapons had been given to Arjuna, just like his Gandiva bow was a special gift. And similarly, he was given this, this chariot, an indestructible chariot from the fire god, Agni. And then he had horses also given by Chitrarata. And the horses were very powerful and uh, trained to pull the chariot. So the chariot from Agni, if you have a chariot, which, you know, sometimes uh, like Karna, he had a chariot, but his chariot got problems. 
And that was how they were able to kill Karn, because his chariot broke down. So if you have a chariot which is indestructible, it's a great advantage. So the indestructible chariot, and then Kapidwaja, Arjun, the Kapidwaja. Kapidwaja means what? Who knows? Is it the flag? Uh, Hanumanji is on the flag? Yes, right. That's right, Prabhu, yes. Hanumanji is on the flag of Arjuna. The different chariots, you know, just like cars, they have their different symbols, you know, you have a, maybe you drive a, a Porsche or you drive a BMW or you drive a Mercedes, you can tell the make of the car from the emblem which is there on the front of the car. So similarly, in 5,000 years ago, the Kshatriya kings had their chariots and each chariot king would have his own flag and different emblems on the flag would recognize the different kings. So Arjuna, on his flag, he had the form of Hanuman. So it's called Kapitwaja. And that's very nice, auspicious sign also for Arjuna to have Hanuman there on his flag. And Prabhupada explains about that. Would someone like to read this for me? Hare Krishna Maharaj. And this is Vaishnavism. So in the fighting principle, Arjuna is fighting for Krishna. He is following the previous fighting Acharya, Hanumanji. Therefore, he has depicted his flag with Hanuman, that Hanumanji, Vajrangi, kindly help me. This is Vaishnavism. I have come here to fight for Lord Krishna. You fought also for the Lord. Kindly help me. This is the idea. Kapidvacha. Yes, keep reading, Prabhu. So, any activities of the Vaishnava, they should always pray to the previous Acharya. Kindly help me, kindly. This is Vaishnava, is always thinking himself helpless, helpless, and begging help from the previous Acharya. Yes, from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 1, text 20, London, 1973. So, Prabhupada makes the point how devotee will always beg help from the previous acharya. So Arjuna, he is also begging help from Hanumanji. It's described actually that at uh, one point Draupadi had smelt the aroma of a beautiful 1,000 petal lotus flower. And she asked Bhima, could you go and get me more of these lotus petals? I'd like to use them, we can decorate our ashram. So Bhima went racing up the hill to get some more of these lotus flowers. But when he was going up the hill, there was this huge monkey blocking the way. And the monkey just lay there and wouldn't get out of the way. And so uh, the, the monkey challenged Bhima that, you know, you, you can't just go and take these flowers. You have to get permission. But Bhima said, look, look, I'm a Kshatriya, I don't beg from anyone. And so they began to fight with each other. And the monkey and Bhima had a huge fight, fought for a long time. And then finally, then Bhima could understand, and, and the monkey could also understand, that they were related to each other. That Hanuman was actually this was actually Hanuman, and Bhima is also, he's actually a, an, an expansion coming from, he's connected there to Hanuman, he's got some connection there, they're like brothers. And so they became friends to each other, and Hanuman offered the blessing to Bhima, he said that, I will go on Arjuna's flag, and whenever you need my help, just call out loudly and I'll be there to help you. And so that's why Arjuna always had Hanuman on his flag also, that he thought that just like Hanuman fought so nicely in the service of Lord Ram, so Arjuna is also begging Hanuman's help that he can fight nicely 
for the service of Lord Krishna. So Prabhupada said, devotee will always pray to the previous acharya, kindly help me. We should never think that we can surpass the previous acharya, but pray for help from the previous acharya. All right? So the, we heard the different points about victory for the Pandavas. So Prabhupada explains here, there is two missions, not only to give protection to the devotees, but also to kill the demons. So the devotees of Krishna should be trained up both ways, not only to give protection to the devotees, to give them encouragement, but if need be, they should be prepared to kill the demons. That is Vaishnavism. All right? And now we're going to ask you, consider ways the above quote may be misused. Discuss the consequences of such misuse. And we want to do this as group work. How many people do we have here today? In Maharaj. How many? Fifteen. One five. All right, 15. So we'll make three groups of five. Five people in each group. Can we, is somebody able to do that for me? Hi, Krishna uh, Maharaj. I'll uh, just see if I can create three groups. Uh, Maharaj, can I yeah. ask one question? Yes. Um, uh, my question is Vishnu Dev and Dronacharya. They were such elevated souls, always like serving Krishna, but then why they did not spoke up when uh, Draupadi was going through such, uh, like such difficult times? Why were they quiet? Well, that's, that point is discussed by many people, why they didn't speak up. There are different explanations are sometimes offered. One explanation is because they were living there in the palace, and because they were accepting the food and the shelter, they were being cared for, they were being provided for by the people in the palace. So they did not like to speak up, to voice their opinion about how, what should, what should not be done. They didn't say anything, they kept quiet. Because they were living there, they were living off of them. So they could not say it. That's one possibility. Another reason is possible. I heard that uh, Bhishma, at least, that he had eaten some food which had been contaminated. And because he had eaten some contaminated food, it had polluted his mind. And his mind was not in pure consciousness. Therefore, he didn't say anything. Thank you, All right, so here's the quote and here's the exercise. Ways this quote may be misused, first of all, may, how, and the consequences of such misuse. And we want to hear the best example from your group. All right, here's the quote. So way, how, do, how can this quote be misused? How can the quote be misused and the consequences of that misuse? All right? Is it clear, everyone? Have we got three groups? Uh, yes, I have created them, so I'm just about to open them now so everyone can join their rooms. Okay, you got about 10 minutes to do this. Thank you, Mark.
Okay. I think we should close the groups now. Hare Krishna. Oh, good. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes. Okay, so I've just uh, closed all the rooms now, so everyone should be coming back for discussion. Oh, good. Yes. I hope you can nominate one person in the group to be the presenter. Uh, yeah, we'll ask, we'll, we'll ask each group to um, uh, have one person speaking. I'm just waiting for everyone to come back. Maharaj, we did not get opportunity to pay obeisances to you first before beginning the class. So we are going to pay our obeisances to you, Maharaj, first. Hare Krishna. My obeisances to all of you. I believe we are all back now, Maharaj. Oh, really? Oh, good. All yeah. right. So, um... Okay, so um, uh, if we can get somebody from group one to nominate somebody to speak for them, please. Yes. Anybody volunteer for this? Uh, I can speak a few things before the team can start. So, um, so basically, uh, when we talk about uh, the uh, the uh, mis mistaken uh, understanding of protection of devotees and prepare to kill demons, I think we spoke about uh, acting responsibly first and uh, understanding what uh, demons are in in basically what demons are in the sense uh, is it a, just a bad habit or a quality which is demoniac or is it the personality which we are talking about so um, we spoke about a few examples like Jagai and Madai where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu does um, uh, go ahead and try and kill Jagai and Madai because he, he was behaving incorrectly with Nityananda Prabhu so there's a uh, so if devotees are blasphemed or incorrectly uh, treated, it, it is, um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu does say it is okay to go ahead and, you know, um, um, you know kill them. So and the other example we're talking about is Shishupal, where uh, Bhim was, after Shishupal starts making um, bad comments about Krishna and others, um, Beam wants to immediately go and kill him, but uh, Bhishma stops and tells him he still has his quota. So I think the acting uh, out sp sporadically is something we need to avoid because everybody has their own karma and we need to understand what's the right things to do at what right time. Uh, we also spoke about uh, Bangladesh uh, situation for the devotees and the Ukraine situation where uh, just uh, acting uh, again uh, instantaneously will not help because you need to assess the power of the enemy. Similar to Mahabharata, uh, we, we, uh, Pandavas didn't go as five members of their family and fight. They had an army before they can strategically uh, attack and uh, fight as in a uh, war. So I think it is, um, it is essential to act responsibly. That's the highlights and assess the situation before you can just start misusing the wordings as to kill demons. Um, so from my group can I also add? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, we can read the quote and think, oh, Shla Prabhupada is encouraging killing here. Just any killing demons. You know, someone could interpret it in different ways. 
and uh, we need to see the context in which La Calpada said that also. And in the war, Kurukshetra war itself, the war was the last resort. Peace was attempted also before. Yeah. Okay, thank you, ladies. No, thank you very much. Uh, okay, group two, can we, somebody like to nominate themselves to speak? No? Okay. Uh, you can uh, speak, Sunil Prabhu. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start and then you can all join in because everybody made some really good points. So, Maraj, we were uh, t uh, obviously the, the first obvious one was that um, in terms of misusing these quotes, uh, misusing them, uh, taking them out of context and using them as an, uh, an excuse for violence against others. Um, and taking advantage of uh, you know these teachings um, but also we were talking about the fact that when people do this when they take this out of context and they use it for their own purposes others will see them and see them as represent representatives of religion and therefore repelling people from religion they're getting a, a bad uh, view of what religion is all about so these people who have who are using these quotes uh, for their own use are causing problems for everybody else. Um, the other point, Kamal uh, Prabhu made that um, how do we define what a devotee and what a demon is? Um, we don't we don't readily know uh, what a devotee and demon is, and it's it is explained a bit further on. However, um, those who are using these quotes for their own means um, tend to have selective readings so that they will use one part of a quote for what they want to do, but ignore another part of the quote um, when it comes to um, fighting. Um, Anybody else want to? I think Sir uh, made a. So, which part of the quote would they use when it comes to fighting? Um, they will use, um, but when it says, but if they need be, they should be prepared to kill the demons. Um, so however they interpret what demons they are, uh, they will, um, go ahead and do whatever they need to, to kill those demons. But, you know, they, it depends on their interpretation of what what those demons actually are, who those demons actually are. Mm -hmm. Yes, who is a demon? <laughs> How do we categorize the, de the demons and the devotees? Also, uh, um, one of the group members has also made the, a very good point is that, you know, what is a demon? It's, it's, not, it's not just a physical uh, thing, but it's, you know, demons can mean demons of the mind as well. So, um, when we're talking about demons, we should think about it in different, in correct ways. Okay. Don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. Yeah, that's, these are important points. Yes, understanding who is actually devotee. <laughs> what kind of devotee are we? Hmm. Okay, let's hear group number three. The third group. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will uh, start. Uh, maybe other team members can start. Uh -huh. I think, uh, as Snehal Prabhuji and uh, Arthur Mataji said, we are in the position to uh, defining a devotee is a problem. So we are in so much surprise. So people may think I am the highest level devotee. Others are not devotee. There is a misuse. The main point we discussed is uh, in one way it could become a terrorism, saying that. Anyone who doesn't follow Krishna consciousness rules and regulations, they're all kind of a non-devotees or demonic people. And also when we go for Harinam Kasankirtan or when we go for book distribution, we get meet of so many people. They, they use some words which looks like a uh, insulting to the Krishna conscious movement. And if people think that they are demonic people, it's uh, basically spreads the very negative impressions on uh, Krishna conscious movement and us, so that's why it's very difficult to defend. And the people 
definitely me misuse this demonic, not knowing who is demonic. The other point also we discussed about uh, in days of Kali, uh, as in the Jagai Madai past time, and it and the Prabhu says in the Kali Yuga, everyone is kind of a demonic. Everyone has those qualities if you can't keep going killing everyone. So if people misunderstood this demonic here, so much of violence will be in the world. There will be no peace. And Prabhupada also says that one of the way of preaching is with our character. And if you're going and hurting the other people physically or mentally, then we are not actually preaching of Krishna consciousness. We are basically making people away from Krishna consciousness. Those are the consequences which we discussed. So team members, if anyone wants to add, please. I'm sorry, what's that last point you were making? It wasn't so clear. Okay, so the, the point what I was making, Prabhuji, uh, I mean Maharaj, uh, basically, you know, when, when you hear from the lectures from the Acharyas, it's basically our character is the first preaching. People see how we behave. If we behave well, automatically they'll be attracted to us. But uh, if we misunderstood this killing demonic people, and if we start using the verbal arguments or uh, physical violence, then we are not actually preaching the right thing to the people. They will not get attracted to us because we are creating a violence. So that's the consequence, misunderstanding this, misusing this uh, purpose. Yes, yes, very important. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. And Maharaj, during the discussion, uh, we also tried to find out that the demon, uh, demons are not like only the asuras as we were reading in the scriptures, but it could also be uh, characterized into two parts like external and internal. So as, uh, uh, as Venkat Prabhu earlier mentioned the details, so external could be things like terrorism, misconception, and internal demons could be demons in the mind, which I think other group also mentioned. And the demons, it is not necessary that demons are only in, uh, mind demons are only like outside the Krishna consciousness. It could be in ourselves also. So the obstacles could also be considered as mind demons or if any other devotee is not properly treating another devotee because of any reason, that could also be kind of demonic activity and we should try to also um, explain another devotee that what you are doing is not correct uh, because uh, this will not help you in uh, advancing in Krishna consciousness. So as also Archana Mataji said that attitude uh, and behavior, how we, how, how much we are honest, not that others could see us honest, but to ourselves that are we really honest, uh, only then we could advance and kill our mind demons as well. Mm. And any other team members would like to add? I think one point which I would want to make is uh, it can be classified as demons of ignorance as well. People are not aware what their relationship to Krishna is. So we can kill this demon of ignorance by uh, spreading the knowledge of Krishna consciousness. That is, that can be, we can take it as our duty. Yes, very nice. These are all good points. Certainly, as devotees, our behavior is very important. We want to show a proper example to the society, to the world. And at, at this time, there is always that thread of, you know, terrorism. It's created so much turmoil and havoc around the world, the fear of terrorists. And we don't want to have that kind of reputation. Certainly, as devotees, it's supposed to be a peaceful movement. But, so when Prabhupada talks about uh, killing the demon, it, it could be the demon within our own self, you know, and that we are our own self, we have to control, as, as you brought up, our own mind can be the demon. And we definitely want to curb that demoniac nature. And how to overcome this demonic mentality? Simply by the Sankirtan movement. So by propagating the chanting of the holy names and the, the distribution of Krishna consciousness, it should create a peaceful, God-loving atmosphere. And the demonic tendencies will be all curtailed. 
through the chanting of the holy name and through the distribution of Krishna conscious prasadam and the loving relationships between one devotee and another, it should inspire a peaceful atmosphere, not warlike, not killing each other, fighting each other, and whatever, doing terrible things. We do want to promote a, a peaceful atmosphere. At one point it happened, there was a there was an attempt made to blow up a slaughterhouse. Some, some people had, some, this was in New Zealand actually it happened, that some people had tried to uh, put some explosives in a slaughterhouse. He wanted to blow up the slaughterhouse. And somehow there was a rumor that there was Hare Krishna people were involved. So Prabhupada was very upset, he was very concerned. He didn't want at all that devotees should have that kind of mood or reputation anywhere. But we are loving and caring. That should be the mood of the Krishna consciousness movement. Loving and caring, and we do care for people. We want to help them to get free of that demonic nature, free of the demonic tendency. And the more we distribute Krishna consciousness in a loving and a, a generous way, and then the more we can create that kind of mood. Of course, it's Kali Yuga. It's the age of quarrel. It's a difficult time. The environment is not so conducive for God consciousness. It's not like Satya Yuga, but we can bring back Satya Yuga if we go on preaching Krishna consciousness. So we have to be patient and we have to be tolerant and we have to persevere and tolerate. And, you know, people may attack us, we tolerate. We don't retaliate, rather we tolerate. And it's the duty of devotees to accept the difficulties, but to go on with devotional service, even though there may be difficulties, even though there may be obstacles. All right, we just have a little more here just to go through, to just finish off today. So Prabhupada explains, generally, a Vaishnava is non-violent, just like Arjuna. In the beginning, he was non-violent. He said, Krishna. What is the use of this fighting? Let them enjoy. So by nature he was non-violent, but he was induced by Krishna to become violent. Your non-violence will not help. You become violent. You kill them. I want. So if Krishna wants, we shall be prepared to become violent. So those who are devotees of Krishna, they should be trained up both ways. They should be prepared. But generally, there is no question of becoming violent unnecessarily. From Bhagavad Gita 120, lecture in London, 1973. So, this is a topic of Vaishnava integrity. We have to understand these different kinds of statements in the proper way. We explain here the exchange of spiritual happiness between Krishna and his devotee, in which Krishna is controlled by his devotee, is compared to an ocean of nectar into which the devotee and Krishna plunge. This is the verdict of learned scholars who appreciate Krishna's opulence. The spiritual happiness. <laughs> Nectar, the devotees plunge into the nectar. It's from Chaitanya Charitamrita. So to ensure that students develop Vaishnava integrity in the interpretation, evaluation and application of Shastric knowledge. So we will have this kind of question coming up again in the course of the study of Bhagavad Gita. We need to develop this kind of integrity, how to properly apply the Shastric knowledge. 
All right, and then we have this verse, uh, text number 21 and 22, right? Someone like to read it for us? Oh. Yes? Yeah, go, go ahead, Prabhu. Read. Oh, infallible one, please draw my chariot between the two armies so that I may see those present here who desire to fight and with whom I must contend in this great trial of arms. Bhagavad Gita 121 22. And so, the, the interesting point here is that Lord Krishna is the supreme controller. But he's coming into the battlefield as the charioteer of Arjuna. And therefore Arjuna is giving orders to him. And you see here Arjuna telling Krishna, bring my chariot between the two armies. I want to see who's here, who's desiring to fight. So Lord Krishna is Bhakta Vatsala. He is not Jnana Vatsala or Karma Vatsala, but he is Bhakti Vatsala. He reciprocates with the love of his devotee. So because Arjuna is a devotee, so Lord Krishna is willing to take instructions from Arjuna. And we see Arjuna giving the orders to Krishna. I want to see. I want to see who's here. <laughs> oh, you want to see the, the, the Acharya's joke that you've come to the battlefield, you just want to see. <laughs> You have to fight, not just simply see. So Arjuna said, I want to see who's here, who desire to fight. And I must contend to this great trial of arms. So Arjuna is there on the middle of the battlefield and Lord Krishna is going to drive him into the middle of the battlefield, right in front of Bhishma and Drona. And this will cause the bewilderment of Arjuna and it will prepare Arjuna for submitting himself to Lord Krishna and taking direction from Krishna. Alright, so just to review what we covered today, we identified examples of Duryodhana's diplomacy with reference to the Bhagavad Gita. Are you okay with that? Do you remember some of the examples? Duryodhana's diplomacy? For example, he mentioned Drona before he mentioned Bhishma because Drona is a Brahmana. And he's warning also, he's warning also Drona about the, the Drupada Putrena, the son of Draupadi, that he's born to kill you, you have to watch out for him. And he encouraged Vikarna. He mentioned Vikarna like he was a great warrior, but he's not really a great warrior. All right, so these were some of Duryodhana's diplomacy, diplomatic dealings. And then the liberal nature of the Brahmana, Dronacharya is very liberal, he's ready to teach uh, Drishta Jumna, although Drishta Jumna is born to kill him. He doesn't mind. He wants to teach him. I'm a Brahmana, I should teach him. Even though he's going to kill me, it doesn't matter. The relevance of Arjuna with Hanuman on his flag, that he's praying to the previous Acharya, that as you fought for Lord Rama, let me fight for Lord Krishna. And here we have this Sena Yor Ubayor Madhye Ritam Stayaya Me Chuta. Arjuna ordering Krishna. Arjuna is the servant of Krishna, but he's, Krishna's come as his charioteer. Krishna's controlled by the devotion of Arjuna. That is the significance, that Krishna is conquered by the loving devotion of his devotees. We also spoke about the consequences of misapplying Prabhupada's statement regarding Vaishnavas and violence. We spoke about Prabhupada's mood and mission revealed in the purport, the importance of these aspects for ISKCON, very important for us. We want to teach everyone the value of the Bhagavad Gita.
through the disciplic succession. And here's the final quote. If one understands Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita and becomes situated in Krishna consciousness, engaging himself in devotional service, is reached the highest perfection of knowledge offered by the Vedic literature. If one adopts the principles enunciated in Bhagavad Gita, he can make his life perfect and make a permanent solution to all the problems of life. This is the sum and substance of the entire Bhagavad Gita, from the introduction to Bhagavad Gita. Okay, and now the no there's no class tomorrow, I understand, because there's a special ceremony taking place at Bhaktivedanta Manor, and I'm told you all want to go and attend the ceremony. So uh, there's no class tomorrow, but we will have class next week. And you can prepare, look over the rest of chapter 1, and you can also check also the section, setting the scene, as it's described here in the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Anybody? Maharaj, can I, can I ask a, a quick question? Yes, please, um, Prabhu. Just going back to when we write the start, um, and you're mentioning that uh, Bhagavad Gita is the only scripture that we need to read. I, I kind of often hear others saying that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the only scripture that we need to read. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Yes, well, Bhagavad Gita is presenting the message of Srimad Bhagavatam in a condensed, simpler, simplified form. Srimad Bhagavatam is an expansion, a much more expanded form of Bhagavad Gita. But it's pretty much the same message, you know. The message is surrender to Krishna and take up devotional service. Srimad Bhagavatam is a graduate study, Bhagavad Gita is an undergraduate study, a preliminary study to Srimad Bhagavatam. But you can get everything from Bhagavad Gita. You can read the Bhagavad Gita. Some verses in the Bhagavad Gita, you'll see some are some Bandagyan, some are Abhidaya, and some are Prayojana. So the perfection, the goal of devotional service are also there. All three levels of bhakti, are, the, all three levels of knowledge of devotion are there within the Bhagavad Gita. It's not that there's anything lacking there in Bhagavad Gita. Everything is there. It's just a question of how, how we understand it. We can study the Bhagavad Gita at the level of Bhakti Shastri, and you could go on and study Bhagavad Gita at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav, and you could go on and study Bhagavad Gita at the level of Bhakti Vedanta also. You could go deeper and deeper into it. And Srila Prabhupada wanted to write another version of Bhagavad Gita. He was ready to write another edition. And the devotee said, Prabhupada, you already wrote Bhagavad Gita. But Prabhupada said, no, he said, there's so, much, so many more commentaries by the Acharyas. There's so much more to say on Bhagavad Gita. So don't think everything is just this, this one book, Bhagavad Gita, is complete. There's so much more. And that's why people like uh, Burijan Prabhu brought, brought out his edition, Surrender Unto Me, which brings more of the commentaries of uh, Baladeva Vijabhusan and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. There are other Acharyas also who commented on Bhagavad Gita though. There's so much more. It's so deep. We're only just scratching the surface, just getting the basics. Okay. So Bhagavad Gita, yeah, it can give you everything you want. You just have to, you just don't think, just like Lord Chaitanya told Devananda Pandit, don't think you've ever understood Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati lectured on the first verse for 30 days 
And he could have lectured more. There was so much more to say, but he stopped after 30 days. And so that was just the first verse of Srimad Bhagavad. Prabhupada said, uh, what is it? 18,000 verses. You can speak for one month on each verse. So, <laughs> 1,500 years you can speak on Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> if you have a long life, you can live. For 1,500 years you can relish Srimad Bhagavatam. All right, any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much. So we hope to see you all next week and have a good weekend. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Thank you very much, Thank you very much for your Hare time. Hare Krishna Baharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Marijis.